Hey, everybody. Welcome back to this episode of Spear Factor. Today, we have uh, Zach Rollins from uh, the Northeast, Rhode Island, I guess. Is that correct? Yeah, that's that's right. Yeah, spot yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, you're like the second guest uh, from the show. It's from Rhode Island. Um, Dave is our... Am I really? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Good yeah. guy. Yeah. yeah. Right. And uh, so tell us a little about yourself. I mean, you got a podcast. You're into fishing. You, you, you kind of like some of us that live and breathe it because you work on the water as well. So fill us in here. Yeah. So, um, you know, as Brett said, my name is Zach Rollins. I'm from uh, Rhode Island, a small town called North Kingstown, right outside of Wickford. And, you know, I, I have my own podcast called Along the Keel, where we highlight and spotlight people that are building their lives by the coast, mostly focusing on coastal and outdoor brands, but also talking to guys like, you know, Brett and some other people that just, you know, like Brett had said was, you know, live and breathe the ocean, the coastal lifestyle. And then we also kind of, you know, go shoreward a few times and, and talk to people just in the outdoors in general. So, um, thanks for having me on the show. And, uh, yeah, I basically started in the maritime world or, or just kind of growing up here in Rhode Island and cut my teeth as a, as a captain, you know, I got my captain's license in college. And then from there, always kind of stuck with it, working on the water since I was about 12. And now I currently work as a Marine in, um, towing in a salver, uh, Marine assistance towing captain here in Rhode Island, and then also do some deliveries and whatnot. But along the keel is, you know, like I said, a podcast, but it's also much more, it's becoming its own little brand and media company. So it's a, uh, it's pretty cool. And, 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 you know, also being associated with waypoint, which is how we met, um, having you a part of the podcast network, you know, got in touch with you after listening to the podcast with a gentleman, other guy from Rhode Island, the spear fisherman. And I was like, oh man, Brett's got to be a part of this uh, waypoint thing and reap the benefits. So uh, here we are, happy, you know, talking and uh, chopping it up. Uh, that's awesome. Since you're 12, that's pretty impressive. And then uh, you, <laughs> you mentioned oh, wow. the, the, the salvage stuff. Uh, so I think the last time we were messaging each other, there was the hurricane going on. We were going to plan to do the podcast. And then yeah, uh, I was like, why don't we just take a rain check on that? <laughs> You're going to be busy. <laughs> um, yeah. So, have you, so I guess the thing is we'll fill everybody in this waypoint thing. Um, mm-hmm. I, you just, I guess you emailed me and I really wasn't sure what it was. And I, I think for a layman's term, for me, it was basically a collection of m- intermediate like our medium size, smaller size, medium size, bigger size, whatever, just a collection of podcasts, outdoorsmen, um, terrestrial and Marine and, Mm -hmm. um, put it all together in a nice package so that the listener can go there and kind of get a one-stop shop kind of deal. Is that, that's kind of what I got out of it. Yeah, that's pretty spot on. I mean, Waypoint has been around for about four and a half, five years. And it originally started as a result of, basically these two guys, Tim and Rich, who have a show called Into the Blue and the Saltwater Experience. And these two TV shows have been on the air for almost you know two decades now. And basically back in the early 2010s, when you know people were cutting the cable, Netflix was now becoming an online streaming service. Um, you had you know other streaming services like Redbox and Samsung Plus TV kind of coming onto the forefront. You know, they saw this big dip in their downloads from their typical channels like Discovery Channel and um, ESPN and a bunch of other regular commercial television. And we're like, you know what? We're not making as much money as we were. You know, the viewership's going down. Why don't we just kind of bring this in house and do it ourselves? So that's exactly what they did. They created Waypoint, which is an online stream uh, streaming platform and a service that you can download for free on any tablet device. And then you can also go on the Waypoint TV app, or if you have a Samsung TV, a Vizio TV, you can download it and get on-demand content of all things outdoors. So if you're a hunter or fisherman, you know, you can watch um, documentaries, shorts, as well as, you know, listen to podcasts and it's all curated for the outdoorsman. So guys like you and I, who, you know, both have podcasts that kind of represent the outdoor space. um, It's a great place for us because we can go and connect with other outdoorsmen who are doing the same thing in the, in the media space, but at the same time also get, you know, a direct connection to other people that are already out there looking for fishing content, looking for hunting content, and then stumble across us and be able to say like, Hey, you know, I like 
this podcast, why wouldn't I like this podcast? So um, Waypoint in its in its entirety is a, you know, basically a curated platform for all things outdoors. Yeah, um, that that's, the, I think, the thing that appealed to me was that even though, um, you know, so many of us do different variations of outdoor activities, we're all kind of the same type of people. Like, we all... I think regardless of what we do professionally, we all have this like general understanding of how the world works. And we kind of like, regardless of all the complicated lifestyles and anything like that, it's just nice to be able to escape and um, spend time outdoors. And then if you happen to shoot something and eat it, that's even better, yep. you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, so how long have you been doing your podcast for? It's been about a year and a half now. I started in, 2020. Yeah. So the beginning of the pandemic and, um, you know, it was kind of a result of just my curiosity. And I, at the time I was living in Hawaii on the big Island working as a captain. And I had moved out there with a buddy of mine from college. Didn't really know him all that well, but it was like, you know, he was looking to move somewhere and I was kind of looking to make a change. And that's what I did. Moved out to the big Island and I knew I was going to get jo- get a job because you're on an Island and people you know, have boats out there. And I don't know, it just seemed like a pretty uh, easy math equation. And uh, I immediately got a job. The funny thing was I, I got the, how I got the job was I went to the local Marine store, which is the only one on the Island. I think you've spent some time there, right? Brett? At Honokahau, that little Harbor. Um, yeah. I've spent not, not honestly, not much time on the big Island. I've literally went there once with the kids on the way back from okay. a deployment. Um, and then we stopped there saw the volcano, did the whole touristy thing. And then I spent a little bit of time on Kauai and, uh, you know, Oahu, but just all touristy stuff, mainly, um, family kind of type stuff. Um, but I would like to go back there to exclusively like spearfish. Um, but mainly, yeah, surfing and and just family stuff, you know? So. I got you. I got you. Well, it's definitely a spot for you. I mean, it's only like, what five hours from California, so not too bad. Yeah, it's like um, five and a half. But yes, I was five and a half. Yeah, so that's not bad. But for me, it's like twenty-four. So that's that's like a puddle <laughs> jumper. Um, but yeah, you know, and then from working as a captain and like my experiences in the past, um, I was like, you know what? I, I got some curiosity. I got some questions for these people, and I always was interested in branding and business and whatnot and entrepreneurship because I've also done some entrepreneurial things in my life. And I wanted to learn more. So I, you know, asked that question to myself and started a podcast and had some friends on that I knew that had businesses in the outdoor space and, you know, mostly the coastal side of things and uh, had them on. And it's kind of been going on ever since, you know, and during the pandemic, I was really doubling down. I was doing like two episodes a week, which now is way too much. Like, as you know, creating a podcast is a lot of work. Um, so two episodes a week became way too burdensome. And then I, I'm eventually moved back to the, the mainland, back to Rhode Island and, uh, has, you know, continued to work as a captain throughout the whole time. And the podcast has really taken off to where, you know, I get to walk, walk and talk with and rub elbows with brands that are big, small, you know, people that are in on all walks of life. And the cool thing is it's becoming its own little, um, I guess you could say curation or network, if you will, of in itself. You know, because we've got Waypoint being its own network, and then along the keels become its own network. So that was going to be, and what we're working on now, brands and stores, and you know, kind of curating stories behind products that you know I use, you use, and then being able to present them in a different way. And that's kind of what we're going to be launching in October um, with this whole new supply side to the podcast. And the podcast is kind of going to be the the meat to tell the story. Nice. So when you were in the big Island, um, did you do much diving out there? You know, so I really can't dive all that much, but what I did do, um, which was awesome, you know, part of the charters that we would do are these manta ray tours. So basically you sit on a, um, like a surfboard, a modified surfboard, and you have these big lights that are, that go through the middle of the surfboard. And, you know, for people that don't know that the big Island is so nutrient dense with plankton because of all this upwelling, the manta rays come in wicked close to the coastline. So the, the inner, the, I guess you'd call them like littoral rays come up to the coast. They feed at night. 
But when you have these lights, you can you can have the plankton kind of accumulate by the surfboard. So you'd have manta rays coming up and like grazing your stomach as you lie flat, like Superman style, holding onto the surfboard. And I was the guy that would take people to go do this. But on my days that I wasn't being a captain, you know, sometimes I'd crew and I would basically tie the surfboard to my hip and I'd pull people around looking for manta rays in the pitch dark water uh, off the coast of Kona. So that was probably the, you know, and you know, I'd do that like once or twice a week and then I'd run the boat the other, you know, five days a week. And, uh, that's kind of the closest I came to diving, um, because of my ears, but we did, I did work for a dive outfitter and that was just like the other side of it, but tons of snorkeling, tons of like light free diving. It was, it's the place to be. If you want to go dive, that's for sure. So when you were, when you were, um, working as a boat captain, you know, in a charter and all that, um, when you were doing that, did you have like, I guess anything that you noticed that is pretty typical of, I get you dealt with mostly scuba divers. Is that correct? No. So my, my, our demographic for like the snorkel boat was like, you had the scuba divers, right. Which were all pretty squared away. Cause you got to have a certification. Like they know how to swim. I had the opposite of those people. I had the people that were just either learning how to kind of put a mask on. So you had to show them the ropes and then people that didn't know how to swim. And then some people that were like expert divers, free divers, the whole, you know, nine yards. Um, so my demographic varied drastically. Um, but on the bigger boat, you know, we, we went with people that were just learning how to dive to doing like advanced black water dives to the whole, you know, the whole kind of spectrum. Okay. So I got to ask, what was the craziest shit you've seen people do? Cause I've seen a few <laughs> things that I was like, are you absolutely kidding me? Uh, let's see. Oh man. You're, you're diving deep back into the archives. Um, but I guess some of the craziest shit would be, you know, the amount of panic attacks that I witnessed. <laughs> it was like so stupid, like why they were panicking, you know, like having a mask on your face, which for like you and, you know, guys like us, like I grew up, snorkeling and free diving in my backyard and you know for some people that were coming from like arkansas who didn't even know how to swim um it, the, i think the craziest thing would have been so we're we're in Kalaki, uh, Kialakikua bay which the bay stands for in god's pathway in hawaiian and it was the place where captain cook came and landed and you know discovered hawaii for the white man right he didn't discover anything he just found more people um so one of the days we took this family out and it was a family. It was like a grandmother, a mother, and then her two kids and her two kids were like 30 years old. So the mother was pretty old and they go out and, you know, I don't have advanced like ENS type, you know, stuff, but the guy, my crew member was, a, is a retired fireman, Phil. And so he's on the boat and I love when Phil comes on the boat. Cause anything medical, I'm like, all right, Phil, here you go. Like, you do your thing. I'm just driving the boat. Like I'm the monkey behind the wheel. And, um, basically what had happened was this, this woman who, you know, unbeknownst to us was a diabetic and she basically went swimming. Her kids took her out. She was having a, a, di a diabetic emergency while floating away, just snorkeling around underwater. She didn't speak very good English. So we kind of, she her her kids are dragging her back to the boat as she's having this emergency and they just like throw her. They're like, oh yeah, she, she's having, you know, she's a diabetic, you know, she just needs some sugar. Meanwhile, she's like going completely gray and, you know, Bill and I are thinking like, we should like get everyone, we should bring this woman to the hospital. And, um, she, their kids like literally just dropped them off with us and then went back snorkeling, like did not give a shit about their mother who's having this emergency in the middle of, you know, Kakakua Bay, which, you know, we're like an hours away from any type of EMS. Like there's no Coast Guard on, on the big island. The, the Coast Guard station's in Hilo, which is on the opposite side. So you're like three hours from getting a chopper to you at any point in time. And then the, the Coast Guard would only come over to the big island in Kona from Oahu. And they would only come over like, I don't know, once a quarter, maybe twice a quarter. So you barely saw them. You know, so you're like very reliant on you and the people around you. So when this woman came on board, you know, we brought her on board, let her down. And I was like, all right, Phil, you do your magic, man. And fortunately, like we had all the supplies, like we got her back to health, but it was just such an amazing thing to happen where 
to see like the lack of care <laughs> for someone's mother. And they're like, oh yeah, she's fine. And we're like, well, she doesn't look fine. She looks like she's about to like, you know, go into a seizure here. So like that, and then, you know, just people. Well, maybe they've been there like 400 times. And I don't know, like you're, you're thinking like, usually you just give someone a donut or something, right. When they're having that kind of issue, um, uh, from personal experience, but, uh, just to be like pawn that shit off on you is pretty awesome. Yeah. It's like, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. It's amazing. I feel like when people are on vacation, they forget their brains. Like Mm -hmm. some people, like you said, someone from Arkansas and I'm picking on Arkansas. I got buddies from there, but people that don't know how to swim. And they go and sign up for a snorkel cruise and they'll just jump in and you're like, you don't know how to swim. (laughs) Like what the fuck, man? (laughs) Yeah. I've seen some stuff like that too. That's why I even asked to begin with, because I'm like, you, you, you worked it. I mean, you've got to see some, just some mind boggling stuff. Yeah. And it's, it's like, man, you guys are really that like carefree enough to kind of risk your, cause it's at, at the end of the day, like it's kind of dangerous, you know, like you go into the water you're you're into into an environment that you're just not comfortable in and you're putting on a mask people suck at breathing out of snorkels like you probably know that very you know damn well that they just don't understand like you're breathing in and out of your mouth and then all of a sudden panic sets in and then they're sucking in water and then they're like you know almost a potential drowning victim and then they come to you like what's the issue? And I'm like, what do you mean? What's the issue? It's like, you, you came and signed up for this thing and you have no experience doing it. And you want us to give you a crash course in like two minutes before the boat leaves, you know? And, you know, it was pretty amazing. The amount of people who don't know how to swim. I think that was the most eye opening thing for me because I grew up on the water and just learned how to swim at like as a child, you know, like as a baby, you're, I was in a pool, like on the water, there's a picture of me on a boat and like six months old. So like, this was never a foreign thing to me. So that was very eye opening to people that have no idea how to swim. And if they didn't know how to swim, I would wrap them up in like a life jacket, a float belt, a wetsuit. So I was like, you might know how to swim, but you're definitely not going to sink. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, people don't realize too, like wetsuits, uh, even just surfers, you know, a three, two, when you go surfing and then you go somewhere else, um, where it's tropical and you take your wetsuit off. And then you get held down really long by a big wave or something like that. It's you oh, realize yeah. how much buoyancy you actually get out of that thing. Yeah, a ton. Um, right? Yeah. So, with your current job, like explain that a little bit. What you're doing in your current job? Yeah. So my current job is, you know, and I I kind of transitioned out of the charter. Um, I guess like the I don't know if the right word's not recreational, but you know, taking people out who are either going fishing or snorkeling or whatnot. And then going into more of like a commercial setting. So basically I work for a company, we do a vessel assist. So kind of look at it as, you know, your boat breaks down, you run out of fuel, um, you know, the boat's sinking, boat's on fire, um, all these other, you know, I guess situations that end up on the water that everyone typically gets themselves into at one point or another. Like I saw, it was like the other day on your Instagram, you saw it like you were tying the steering together. Was it? Yeah, that, that fucking sucked. Um, <laughs> that was what, uh, Sunday I went out and, uh, you know, as we we're going out, like everything was fine. And then we were about 20 miles out and I noticed the boat kind of having a mind of its own. And I was like, I know how to drive in sea state. Like, what the fuck is going on? Right. And all of a sudden, then I do like a 360. I was like, okay. So I go neutral. I turn around and I'm seeing the engines just move back oh, and forth. Yeah. And so what's <laughs> going on is that the seal, the piston was leaking hydraulic fluid. Oh, yep. Steering fluid. Sorry. Steering fluid. So, um, yeah, it was just like, so we ended up cross tying it. Mm-hmm. And fortunately, we have two engines. So, like, you could drive anything with that. So it just basically pointed and shot back 25 miles stopping at patties of course along the way still um yeah just didn't find anything um it's pretty amazing it's like the fishery out here is kind of shut down it seems like now you're back i got you okay fishery shut down yeah the fishery kind of just shut down um the last week or two and unless you're going for the big bluefin which you're like 90 miles out yeah. Um, and you got to have good weather, obviously, and a, or a big boat. 
um, yeah, I just shut down and, um, you know, so, oh, just another day in boat ownership, you know, <laughs> that's well, like that day is repeated in my life 24 seven. Every single day is like another day of, oh, my steering doesn't work. Oh, my boat ran out of two stroke oil and I didn't bring any extra on the boat or, oh shit, you know, something is blown apart. So basically what I, it, it's the uh, vessel assist you know, marine towing and salvage. So whether, you know, you're broken down like something like that, you need to tow home or you hit a rock and now you're, you know, just taking on water and, you know, you're, you're threatening property, you know, that's kind of our, that's kind of our shtick, right? Like we're by no means the coast guard. Like if, if you have an emergency hail the coast guard on 16. Um, but if it's something that, you know, can be easily fixed, um, you know, something that you're not really, in a life threatening situation, then that's kind of where we step in and we're like, okay, uh, rather than having the coast guard tied up with towing you home because your battery's dead or that you ran out of fuel, basically. And I think it was in the 1970s, the coast guard said they were no longer doing vessel assist, right? So stuff like regular tows was not really a thing. And that's when the private sector came in and was like, okay, well, we can kind of help out with this and provide marine assistance on the water. So, and, and with that, you know, you do come across situations that are rather unique because you are out on the water 24, seven, 365 on a boat. So you see a lot of weird shit, you know, um, whether it's just like oh, yeah. the regular job that you have to do, but you also have, you know, serious situations where someone does have a mayday call and you're, you know, you're only 10 minutes away, whereas the coast guard's still on shore, you know, prepping their boats, getting the helicopters ready. Well, you can be on scene a lot quicker. So that means every once in a while, you wind up plucking people out of the water or watching boats sink. And then as a result of that, you can then salvage that vessel and, you know, kind of prevent environmental spills, disasters, X, Y, Z. You know, there was like a situation a couple of weeks ago where a woman fell overboard on her, on her sailboat, her and her husband, her husband had a panic attack, which is, you know, that's the best thing to do. Right. Brett It's like the first thing that happens. What do you do? Just you panic. Be- <laughs> yeah. Panic. And then, um, regroup, I guess. I don't know. I don't understand <laughs> that logic. Um, I don't know where, where you learn that, like, uh, where you learn to like, uh, you know, cause shit goes South a lot. Sometimes in the military too. And then, you know, like where you learn to compartmentalize stuff where it's like, doesn't really matter what's going on now. I almost get like a glossed over face, you know, a glossed over look and you just do what you're trained to do. And maybe that's it because if you don't know what to do, you just fucking panic because yeah. you just don't have any idea. You need, you're totally now dependent on somebody to save your ass. And that's my number one thing in life. Like I don't want to ever depend on a coast guard. I don't want to have to depend on vessel assist because he may or may not be there. or She may or may not be there for sure. And your ass is floating to a cliff or something like, (laughs) so no, and it's, it's happened quite a, like quite a few times where I've seen, you know, I always say at work too, like the guy, you know, there's rank structure and all this stuff and being the only civilian, it's kind of funny, but you know, the guy that knows the most is usually the guy in charge when it all comes down to it. So as soon as shit goes south, it's like all heads just turn and look at me yeah, or you or whoever it is, right? It doesn't have to be me, but then yeah. look at the person who knows what's going on. And it's like, okay, like rank goes right out the fucking window. Right. Um, and, you know, that's when the, it reminds me of like, I call it like the dad effect. It's like, you're like a dad, you know, like yeah. everybody's talking to you need dad and turn around with dad and you help, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. We had one time where we were off coast because I was, you know, working with the, the Navy training the dolphins and sea lions, we were off the coast and I heard on the radio, a Navy jet crashed right off Point Loma. Jesus. It, was, it was kind of surreal. And then actually what happened was one of our, our boats was already out there working. So they went and picked up the guys. They were like right there, went and picked them up out of the water. Mm-hmm. And it was like fuel and shit everywhere and parts of the plane. And, you yeah. know, and they were fine. They were like, we'll buy you a beer when we get back in or whatever it was. But I just remember, like, when you work on the water, just the craziest amount of shit happens. Crazy. Uh, yeah, and it, like we had this one for a week. Not to get, not, we had this one lady, Marjorie, like the vessel Marjorie. She would call every day for like weeks, panicking about something. And I guess they ended up kicking her out of the harbor because she didn't pay her 
fees or whatever. And every day she was in a panic because she was like running aground or something. Yeah. And so anytime we heard Vessel Marjorie on the radio, we're like, sweet, she's on the radio. Turn it up, turn it up, turn it up. And we hear it and you hear guys just like totally fucking with her. Like, you're, I see her. She's fine. She's not drifting in the rocks. She's being dramatic or whatever it was. Um, but yeah, just the craziest people on the water. I feel like it's too, it's like marinas are almost like trailer parks on the water. Like, yeah, it, that's, yeah. A, that's a really great way to describe it. Yeah. Go look at the, check this out. Go look at the, uh, at the trash in a marina the recycled trash and see how many bottles of liquor there is. It's incredible. Like not wrong. Yeah. No, I yeah, know. No. It's, like, <laughs> it's funny because it's, it's like people have this perception of, you know, and you know, and then you just go there, like, especially in California, all you smells weed all day, but um, you know, <laughs> but get back to your point here. Like, let's talk about some crazy shit you've seen. Yeah. I mean, there's man, the, the latest was, um, there was that guy whose wife fell off their boat and they were in this, they were in an area that wasn't all that great. And it was just pretty turbulent that day. Good, good sea. And it was in this juncture where basically wind and tide kind of come against each other and it creates for some pretty, you know, steep faces. So what had happened was this woman fell overboard. Her husband panicked like, you know, per usual. And he's just kind of floating around and he's waving me down as I'm going to another call. And basically he, I show up, I'm like, Hey man, like what's the matter? What can I help you? You know, just kind of being a good Samaritan. He's like, Oh, my wife, she fell off the boat. And I'm like, Oh, okay. This is not good. Like <laughs> this is a, here I am thinking like <laughs> oh, fuel or, you know, Oh, something's caught in the keel or, you know, something stupid. Right. Yeah. And here it is. is oh, this is like worst case scenario. Cause you don't know the state of this woman. When was this? What's that? When was this? This was like three weeks ago. Oh, okay. So the water's warm at least. Yeah, it's relatively warm, but you know, I mean, you stay in the water long enough. And right. You're going to get yeah. hypothermic either way. But in the wintertime, that shit's like 39 or something, right? Like oh, in the wintertime, you fall in, like you got yeah. maybe 30 seconds to a minute before you <laughs> don't get shock. Yeah. 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 That's, why, that's why I asked. Yeah. Yeah, no, shit changes in the winter for sure. Like I wear a full-on uh, Mustang survival suit um, and it's not really a dry suit. It's semi-dry, um, but it, you know, it's insulated. It keeps you warm and, it, and it's type five. So it keeps you afloat. Um, so I'm like all of a sudden like turning to, okay, this is now rescue mode. Like, where is this woman? So he points to her. And fortunately a small center console had come up and had thrown her a line. So, and she was actually wearing a life jacket. So thank God. Um, but it was, a, did not fit very well. So she was, her head was in neck, which is like still up to the, you know, up, like from going underwater. Right. So they had a line to her. I show up and I have a big 10 meter, you know, inflatable rib that jet, jet drives. And I'm like, okay, what can I do? So I don't want to get too close to her because it was kind of turbulent out. So I wasn't getting, I didn't want to like crush her with the boat. So basically I tied off, I tried tying off to the other guy's boat, but that guy was like kind of clueless. So he couldn't even pull me in. And uh, all of a sudden this, this little whaler comes out of nowhere, blowing a whistle. And it was a, it was a sailing instructor with a bunch of kids over there. Saw this whole thing go down, goes up to the lady. Cause it's only like a 13 whaler. So you can pretty much like reach over and grab her. Um, Cause the other people were struggling to get over the rail. And then this lady was struggling to get over the rail and you know, this lady was rather big who was in the water. So I finally throw them a line to the whaler, pull them over to me. And, uh, I, I just grabbed her by the life jacket. I told her to turn around. She's like, I can't do it. I can't do it. Like I'm, I'm too heavy. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Just turn around. She's like, no, no, get me a lot. I'm like, lady, you got to turn around or, or this is going to be a long day. So she finally did. I grabbed her by the life jacket and I just like picked her up and plopped her right there on her ass, like on my swim, on my swim platform. And she goes, wow, how did you do that? And I'm like, you know, I don't know. Just, just let's, let's, let's get this party moving. And then all of a sudden the fire department came, the, the fire department, I saw them peel out. So I radioed them. And then I was like, all right, like, here you go. You know, all right, this is your job now. <laughs> and, uh, I just went back to doing what I had to do before. So, um, it's, 
definitely interesting moments like in Hawaii you just see weird shit on the water people without navigation lights coming out of nowhere you know getting tangled up in nets off the sh- offshore like you know 10 miles offshore and and the thing about boating is is like I always kind of come with the mentality similar to you it's like all right no one's coming it's up to me you know and then if it reaches a point where you know I'm taking out water, like I'm sinking, like, okay, what's the next step for me to like not die in this situation? And then to another degree is like, okay, how can I prevent this? Right. So if it's, it's usually it's the dumbest thing ever, you know, usually it's a, a loose fitting that came off, you know, like I've salvaged plenty of boats where it's just, you know, the, the AC condenser line came off and was just filling the boat overnight. And that's how it sank. You know, it's like stupid stuff like that. And most of it you can prevent, you know, without having anyone come and, 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 you know, have to allocate resources to. So it's, there's always something going on in the water. I'll tell you that. Well, what are some of the more common things that you see? Like, um, so from like a regular assist, it's usually battery stuff, you know? And, yeah. and, and to be honest with you, like 80% of it is your kill switch is out. <laughs> I had this guy the yeah. other day, you or know, boats and gear. Yeah. Boats and gear. Is yeah. it, and that's how we start out. And it's like, is your boat in gear? Oh yeah. It's not in neutral. Okay. And then you typically you'd be like, all right, let's, let's put it in gear. Let's put it out of gear, you know, because sometimes, you know, the transmission won't be perfectly lined up. And it happens, it's happened to me before where I'm like, oh shit, why is the boat not starting? Like it's in neutral, but the transmission is just, it's old, you know, like stuff's old, gets old, gets worn out. So it's just kind of assessing your basics, like battery, fuel, kill switch, gear, and just kind of going through the motions and being like, okay, it's not these things. Like what's the next thing? You know, like the other day I had this guy, he goes, I hit a bump, you know, a wave, right? I hit a bump and you know, the boat just died and I go, okay um is your kill switch in he goes what's that and i go you know the red lanyard thingy that's up by the helm he goes oh you mean this thing and he like holds it out you know completely detached from everything and i go i just laughed i'm like yep that's it like that should be in (laughs) and sure as shit you know like i i put it back in and he's like dude i swear to god if you start this boat up with with that just being the problem i don't know what i'm gonna do i'm gonna sell this thing I turned the key over and started right up. He's like, oh my God, his buddies were ragging on him. But, you know, it's stuff like that. That's like the typical thing. Well, I think people forget to, um, because I've had a couple of people approach me about this is, where are you supposed to learn this stuff from? You could take a captain's course even then. It doesn't necessarily mean it's practical as far as like, obviously a captain's course, you're supposed to get so many hours. So by then you have learned all those practical things. But um, to start out with, though, like taking a California boater safety course here, you have to do that. It's like, um, you know, it's like getting a driver's license out of a Cracker Jack box. But, you know, they're trying to do their best. But I mean, where are you supposed to learn this stuff? Like and where where, you know, if you didn't grow up on the water um, and we were I was talking about that when I was spending, you know, when we're offshore, I was like, thank God, like I've you know, growing up on the water or whatever, had experience with boats and all of that, because I could see some poor guy or girl buying their brand new boat, going out for Dorado or something. Yeah. Big time. And the steering goes out and then he's sitting there 25, 30 miles offshore, just spinning in circles, waiting, you know, Wait. eight hours for vessel assist to come get him. Like, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah, go ahead. I don't, you know, it's, it's a mix, I think, you know, cause part of it is, you know, self-exploration, you know, I think if you're committed enough, like anything like this podcast, I know you didn't have an audio, you know, technical background in audio, but it was, <laughs> no. Google, you know, <laughs> yeah, no. yeah, yeah, like same thing. Like, you know, I, did I grow up like on my iPhone and whatnot? Yeah, sure. But audio wise, like I learned this from YouTube and Google, you know, and just YouTube university. And that's how I figured it out. Um, so I think it's like, 20% that in, in the, in the, in terms of boating, but, and not to say that you can't go learn all of it, but it definitely takes time. And I think that's really what it is, is like growing up in this world. Cause it really is its own world, like living by the water. I think 
covers you 90% of it. Because typically, if you live by the water, if you live in a town that is, you know, a fishing town, um, just, you know, as a coastal town with people are going fishing and clamming and, and just spending time at the beach, like water confidence is probably a, a massive percent, you know, because if you don't, if you're not confident in the water, just being in the water, chances are you're not going to want to go on a boat because the water is scary, right? Like if you're on a boat and you don't know how to swim, you should probably think about another hobby. You know, it's just not a good idea, not, not a good thing to mix. Um, so, but there are like ways to get involved and there are like, I, I taught boating for quite a while and, um, you know, there are courses out there but you got to, you're going to have to commit. You know, I think that's part of it. It's like going to the gym, like, you know, you're a coach. So if, if you have a kid that shows up for, and he's only coming four days a week and that's all he does, like he's not stretching. He's not going to the gym. He's not staying after hours. Like you're just not going to be good, you know? And that's just, that's part of it is time, time behind the wheel, like time being able to feel it because so much of boating is being in a situation. Like all of a sudden you're in, you're in a tight fairway and you don't know what to do because the wind's coming against you, the tide's against you, like everything's against you, how are you going to react? And that's kind of when your, your instincts, you know, kind of come into play and you start to feel the boat, you start to feel the water. You know, you look up at a, at a telltale, like a flag or, you know, a windsock and you're like, okay, the wind's coming here, the tide's going out, like the current's doing this. And all of a sudden it kind of, it's all like a big math equation. I kind of feel like sometimes I'll go in a fairway with a boat on the hip and, you know, it's like the scene from, um, what's the movie where they go to Vegas, the three guys, Oh, the hangover hangover, right? Yeah, and good times. Yeah. Pocket, like gambling. And he has like these numbers flying around his head and he like puts down the right cards. Um, a lot of that I think is a great analogy for boating. Cause it's as much of it is you want to be able to go and learn yourself. Like part of it is just being out on the water and like just feeling it. I mean, it's, it's just, it's experience, <sighs> excuse me, can't even talk. It's experience. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. And if you have a friend that, you know, and I think that's the biggest thing with spear fishing, with really any activity, water stuff, especially water, because water can kill you, you know, um, it's like, uh, the amount of time spent on the water just pays dividends. And when it's really, truly part of your life and your job the amount that the learning curve is just through the roof. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I think that's what happens a lot of times around here uh, in anywhere where people die, you know, drowned or they're spearfishing and accidents happen is that they're, you know, getting like surfing, right? Like going to the beach and surfing. Okay, cool. Like, and you do that, you can do that. But now you're talking about like, now there's a whole nother level of it where, you can get yourself in really bad situations surfing yep. as the currents and as everything increases. So you're talking about someone that might move from um, Austin that wants to learn how to surf versus someone that grew up in the water that understands waves, currents, you know, and then now you put both those guys on a boat. Mm -hmm. Like the guy that grew up on the water has this inherent like, understanding of water movement and how to do all these other things right versus the guy from austin who's like learning from the get-go really don't have any idea how the shit works and is not able to parallel things like so he has much you know not as a steep learning curve like and and i as far as like i've seen that in so many facets like uh we talk about it spearfishing like you know, and there's a debate about, you know, taking a free diving course. Is it good? Or is it like basically handing someone a loaded weapon? Um, oh, excuse me. Yeah. No um, yeah, <laughs> not feeling real great right now. Um, but are you handing someone a loaded weapon who has no background in, in the water and diving? And now you have these brand new people going to a hundred feet and doing diving, you know, and hunting fish at 80 feet where you know there's a threshold where you get past certain points like the 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 threshold becomes you know i, mean, I guess the there's less and less margin for error and the consequences you know greater and greater and greater not that it's any you know let, dying is any less you know in 30 feet than it is in 60 or 90 feet but the chemistry aspect of it all it, it's very it's a, it's a real thing and it and so 
I understand people's arguments when they say with free diving teaching, like I took a free diving course when I was after 20 years of diving, you know, um, cause I really think you can never stop learning, but I'm glad I'm in a lot of ways. I'm glad that I knowing how competitive I am and all this other stuff. I'm glad that I waited 20 years because if I had been say, Hey, let's go to hundred feet, let's go to hundred feet, let's do it. I'll right. stay down there. And I feel great by the way. Yeah, of course you feel great. You know, a lot of partial pressure. I feel great. Then I blacked out on the way up, you know? Mm. Um, so it's same with boating. I guess it's like, yeah, you throw someone, anybody who can go out and buy, you know, a 200, $400,000 boat and you see it all the time. I know you see it every day. It's oh, like, God. they don't have a fucking clue how to park it, how to just operate it. And mm -hmm. kind of in their defense, it's how are they supposed to even know that, you know, like it blows me away. I, I, because I think about this, how would you know how to park a boat without royally fucking it up? Like, <laughs> Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like practicing Well, practicing, you could, you know, if you don't know, and you, like we said, panic, you're going to smash in, you're going to take a big chunk of the fiberglass smashed in and all this other stuff. But, um, fortunately for me, I grew up on boats and then my, most of my adult life was on government boats. And you know how that goes. Like yeah. number one, I'm not paying for gas. Number two, who gives a shit? So let's go. Probably pinned and yeah. We well, just yeah, <laughs> just drive like straight assholes, yeah. um, and uh, yeah, and just like ah, I could fit it in between there. <clears throat> nope, I guess not. Oh well, you know. Uh, yeah. Anyways, but by doing that, you learn how to be a really, a really good driver because you can. Just, yeah, you do. You don't. Yeah. There's no consequence for you failing. So who cares? Just trust right. and error. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so I think like people that that jump into it, um it's it's they're almost set up to fail in a lot of ways if they don't tiptoe into it you know like i always say like get a small boat like even if it's an aluminum like small and used just small yes small yeah. and don't like so many people i know like oh we're gonna get a boat i'm like they're gonna sell that shit in six months or a year watch and when you do i'll be here to buy it like because it sounds great and i get it like everybody loves being on the water until you got it you don't see the beginning and the after parts of it as far as the maintenance and all that stuff, but also just the operation when you, when, when you're responsible and this is part of the reason why I wasn't really like keen on doing charters all that much is like, cause you're responsible for a bunch of people. There's a lot of stress, like, especially yeah. when you're talking about, uh, someone that jumps in the water and immediately has a panic attack and you're like, fuck. Yeah. yeah cause that's happened to me too. And it's like, dude, I don't, I'm not getting paid enough for this shit. This is like stressful. I know I want everybody to be okay because I truly care, but God damn, it's so stressful. Excuse me. Gosh darn. But yeah. No, it definitely can be. I mean, there's always like, there's different levels too, because when I was working in Hawaii and doing charters, like you're dealing with people that in, in some way it's out of your control. You know, like a lot of things you're out of control when you're on the water, but when you are saying, okay, like here's a mask and snorkel, like go play, you know, because that's part of the experience and go snorkel around and see the pretty fish and, and, you know, watch and nurse sharks who wonder them. Right. But you also have like this, this almost like this sense of faith where, okay, I'm going to take this person and I'm going to let them do their thing. Right. Like that's, there's almost, there's, there's a lot of trust that they're putting in you. And then there's also more trust that you're putting in them that they probably realize. Right. So it, it's definitely an interesting, you know, junction, right. And, in, in a, part of that was you also kind of have to curate who you're putting out there. Like you got to kind of read people. And if, if you know that person's not going to be good, like even if there's like a chance, if that, that person is going to, you know, panic in some way, put them in a life jacket, you know, like put them in that extra line of safety that way. Like if I know like, okay, yeah, they got a mask and snorkel, but they also have a life jacket or a float belt or a wetsuit. And even if they want to push back on it, like, I don't, I just don't know what to tell you. It's, and then you just blame the company. You're like, all right, it's a company policy, right? Like I'm going to tell you a company policy, right? Cause it is. And, and that's the level of safety. Cause your job is to like make them have a safe and fun experience, you know? And there is a certain switch. Like I call it like the captain, the captain switch. Like you can be all hunky dory, but all of a sudden, like you flip that switch and you're now the captain and it doesn't matter. Like there's a certain level of, okay, we're going to hear it have fun, but we're going to do it really, really safely. Cause I'm, I'm the guy that's kind of taking the shots. Right. Um, whereas like in the job that I have now, there is that level of faith because you're dealing with a lot of property, 
you know, but, uh, but property and human life are two different things, right? Like you treat those completely separate of one another. And even if there was a situation where it's like, okay, these people are in danger, they're coming off the boat and we're going to worry about the boat later. Right. Um, but in, in most cases, like, you know, I've been very fortunate, knock on wood to never have to have to enc- encounter that too closely. Um, but you know, safety is always like top priority. Right. And you're trying to mit- put on like these mitigation levels of, you know, different things like, okay, life jacket, check. Okay. Are the lines, you know, in good shape, check. Are you, you know, are you trying to gauge the wind waves? Are you going out in weather that you shouldn't be out in? Like all these things that when you're a newer boater, you just don't even think about, you know, because why should I check the weather? It doesn't matter. Like, oh, the sea state, five feet. Oh, my, you know, I'm five feet tall. That's not very big. Like, you know, all these things that people just don't anticipate. And it really takes experience to, to know what to look for, you know, I think is the biggest thing. Yeah. I think that's a good point. Like, is that a challenge? Like how many of the guys out there listening right now, uh, understand when you have like, let's say, you know, when coming from the South and then the, the water is draining out of the Bay mm-hmm. coming from, uh, North to South. And now all of a sudden you have this wind start sta- stacking up the, the, you know, and that, that stuff right there is enough. I'm sure you everybody sees like qualified captain where they're like coming in, whatever, uh, in Florida yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, whatever. Yeah. And it's just like, that's the shit that sinks boats though. Right. And, um, you gotta be aware. So get over to the side possibly, or get out of that like river, so to speak. Or just slow down. Yeah. And then, so people don't, well, people don't like, so what are your options, right? Like, so you have to go through the whole thing, like, okay, this is what we should do, you know? And, and so it's the same thing with divers. I hear like some, one of the, one of the guys I felt really old right there. I was said one, one of the kids, <laughs> one of the guys was like, uh, Hey, is anybody going diving tomorrow? And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, did you not check the surf report? It says it's eight to 10 feet, you know, and you want to go for a shore dive. Like, now, granted, yeah, I mean, I've dove in that before. It wasn't fun. It was for work. Uh, but I mean, just to be naive, right? That's not, right. And, and and I understand why people are naive, but you do not want to get caught cheating in the ocean because she does not care who you are oh. and you can die. And then, you know, um, but so. And that's kind are, of the cool thing, like you bring up that point and not to mean to interrupt, but like. No, go ahead. I think that's why I'm attracted to the ocean so much because, you know, you look at people that just don't see the respect that you have to give the ocean, because if you respect it, it gives back in tenfold. But if you disrespect it, like it takes away everything within seconds, you know, like you could be, you could be having a great day and you mess up one thing on your boat and now your boat's at the bottom of the ocean and you're floating around, right? Or, you know, you go out on the beach and you're not paying attention to the riptide and you get ripped out to sea, you know, and if you're not, if you're not confident in the water, like if I got caught in a riptide, I'm pretty confident that I'd be able to swim out of it, you know, cause I can tread water for an extended period of time, swim parallel to the shore. Like obviously there's different levels of that, but you know, your basic riptide here in Rhode Island. Okay. I'd probably survive someone that's from, you know, the city who is coming to the beach on weekends and doesn't really know how to swim all that well riptide is you know is like a death wish right so it, well yeah think, and on the flip side of that too like surfers we we use the riptide to get out you and, know, and the yeah. lineup right so use right. it for your advantage where some kid might see that and jump in there and everybody's going out over there and then get sucked out and get tired you know right yeah it's just so i think it's, it's go ahead it's respect, you know like having that respect yeah you know? I, and that goes in all different ways it's like you respect the danger of the ocean but at the same time, you also respect, respect it for its beauty. You know, like you're, you're, you have a conservation mindset, like you're not throwing things in the ocean. You're trying not to pollute at the fuel dock. Like, you know, all these little things that add up and I think a make you a better person, but B just, they kind of, I call them, they're like brownie points towards the ocean. It's like karma, karma right? Like if, yeah. you, if you do a lot of good things, you know, while you're on the water, chances are you're going to be all right. You might catch a big fish one day. She might give it back to you. Bye. Yeah, maybe. Still waiting on it. Yeah, 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 exactly. No, it's funny because uh, what I've noticed is a lot of my old job, uh, we worked on the water. We dove every single day, pretty much either dive supervising or diving. We got to see every day. But I noticed all of us as we started having kids, it was funny because we were the most like cautious and 
I don't want to say paranoid because not, not paranoid is not the right word, but very cautious, like around the ocean and even around pools. Like I'd always just jump in the water with the kids so that I knew I was there and engaged. But you get to these pool parties. I mean, this is kind of getting off the subject, but everybody like cracks no, a beer not. and they're just doing whatever the fuck they want to do. I pulled out like yeah. three kids out of pools and it's like, this is not a joke, man. And then you go to the right. ocean and it's like, now you times that by like 10. And oh, by the way, there's no visibility here to find your child. Um, yeah. Cause we've had to dive for, um, you know, unfortunately for a child off of uh, Coronado one time after 4th July. And it's just, it's a shame because I, you know, the ocean demands respect or she'll just take it, you know? Um, so getting back on the boat stuff though, yeah, as, boat stuff. as we go down our rabbit hole of preaching, <laughs> I guess. Um, the, so as far as like, as you said, batteries are a big thing. So would you recommend anything? I mean, obviously I know you guys carry like, would you recommend, um, what are some basic things that you would recommend that maybe aren't required by the coast guard, but, necessarily are, are a good thing to have like Ooh, i don't know steering fluid maybe i don't know yeah that's a good question you know i think steering fluid is a great one you know <laughs> um a, a good good battery you know because it's like nine times out of ten it's usually electrical you know and it's funny it's like doing the small things that you wouldn't necessarily think about when you aren't on the water that add up to having a successful season on the water. So like, for example, when you are doing electrical, right, it's putting about, it's putting like a drop of dielectric grease on your electrical fittings that are going to prevent them from corroding and that are going to prevent the, the wires from coming detached from the, the connectors. And then now you have a, a starter that, that works, right? Rather than one that gets corroded and crusty and crappy. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're out there floating out, out to sea and you don't have cramps, you don't have wire, like you just, you can't do it. Right. So I think, um, you know, basic stuff like that, obviously doing your maintenance, your PM, your, your PM maintenance is really, 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 really critical, but like stuff to bring on board. Um, you got a two stroke, bring two stroke oil because I've had a lot of guys do that. Um, you know, a, a, a toolbox, you know, that's something that people just don't think about having a good multi-tool on your boat is really, really, really critical. I use mine. Obviously like I'm out working, like finding people that are in trouble. So I'm using tools all the time, but you know, the biggest thing is like a little bit of, you know, Loctite on your, on your battery, you know, the nuts on your battery. I've had so many times where I show up at the boat and it's literally the guy's like, I don't know why I won't start. You know, I'm like, all right, well, I showed, I go down there and the battery cables aren't even attached, you know, like, cause they came loose. So it's stuff like that, you know, it's like double checking. And then you, you asked about a battery, you know, I haven't personally dealt with this. Um, so I can't recommend it from experience, but lithium batteries are, are super lightweight. They last a lot longer. If they do drop down uh, past a certain voltage, they're more likely to come back to their full lifespan than, you know, let's say a deep cycle interstate battery, you know, now interstate, whichever battery make you're getting, whether it's like a interstate battery or, um, something like, a, I guess the, I think they're called like big reds. I don't know. It's like a red top. You know what I'm talking about? The Optima, uh, Optima. Optima. Yeah. 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 Um, they're all made by the same people right? They're just different branding for the most part. They are. And I just a caution to everybody out there. They're not what they used to be. So yeah. they used to be like really top notch and they cost twice as much. Now I think they make them in the same place and they just run with the name and it's twice as much. So just yeah, FYI. Believe. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, lithium batteries are coming out on the market. Those are supposedly really good. They're also, they also weigh a lot less. So if you're in like something like a Boston whaler, like a 17 Montauk, where you don't when weight is an issue, you know, every pound kind of counts, um, then that's a great choice, you know, but I think the biggest thing that I would suggest is bring tools, you know, bring in a set of wrenches, bring, bring a multi-tool, at least having something in the pot in your pocket where, you know, if you have to tighten something down, you know, splice a wire real quick, um, that's always, you know, good to have. And then let's see what's all what else do i bring that i make sure yeah the tool thing is like uh it's like i feel like i'm naked if i go out without a toolkit 
And it, and it's funny because, oops, excuse me. It's funny because I, uh, you know, our partner in the boat and when I had my own boat, I have my little grab kit and I just grab and go. And the other day I forgot to grab it and we went oh. out and I was assuming that we would have some extra tools and stuff on the, on the, on the boat. But the, my, my buddies that I own the boat with, they brought me in because I have an experienced boat owner and they're like, well, cool, we can use your help, you know? And, um, they don't have tools on the boat. And it was like the fucking antenna fell down. I'm sorry. I've been swearing a lot. The antenna fell down and I was like, Hey, go ahead and grab Wait, We don't have any tools. Like, yeah. And it's like, uh, God, and it's just like the stupidest little thing, yep. um, really can just, you know, when you're on a boat for like 10 hours and it's rough or whatever, just the littlest thing will just wear you down. And then it's not fun. It's not fun right. to be like, yeah. Uh, you know, you're going to need your antenna to be right. mounted up high so you can get reception or, you know, it's just, yeah. yeah. So little things like that, but that's a good point. Yeah. Bring, bring it just a basic toolkit. Yep. Basic toolkit. And then know your fuel gauge. Like rely <sighs> on their fuel gauges on boats way too heavily you have the I think you have the right to do that because it's fresh from the factory but the majority and i think you'd probably speak to this the majority of fuel gauges on all boats suck like you're better off knowing how much fuel you used how much you filled up and then knowing the difference of that and then using that as your gauge right and then over time kind of writing things down and realizing okay i went this far i i burnt this amount of fuel just based on the hours i was out there you know not relying on the, the little needle because that typically doesn't work <laughs> Well, and the other thing with that needle is it'll funny because it'll stay full for a long time. Yeah. And then the next thing you know, it just starts dropping quick. Yeah. And now you've gone out so far. You're like, oh, I'm good. I'm good. Uh oh. Like when you come back. And then, or it's like, it says I have a quarter tank of gas left and I'm done. Like, right. yeah, there's different kinds of fuel. Ga- you want, do you, are you familiar with all the different kinds of um, uh, fuel gauges? I'm only familiar with like the one that, you know, truth be told, not really. Probably the one that like sits on the bottom of the tank, and it's like that little, like almost like a pressure thing. I guess you could say. Yeah, there's a pressure one, but there's also an air like where you would pump up, like put tension, uh, pump pressure into the uh, into the tank, and it mm-hmm. measures like I don't even know how it does it. I'm sure someone's listening. It's like, yeah, you idiot. Um, but you do that, and it'll tell you how much. Like those are the most accurate, I believe. Okay. But um. Yeah, because we have one on our 11 meter ribs, and you basically just put, you just pump it a couple times, and it's like, it's almost reminds me of like pumping your um, a blood pressure thing, like you just pump yeah, it yeah, up, yeah. and yeah. it tells you where it stops. Like, okay, it's full. Um, but yeah, so those things like that, um, and every boat is different. I, I think like even the throttles, everything. I've never been on a boat and like, oh, it's exactly the same. Right. There's all these like new little nuances, um, just like a car, but I think it's like times 10 even because you're basically on roller, uh, like ice skates on a boat when you're trying to drive it. And yeah, <laughs> yeah if you give it like too much gas or whatever. So, um, yeah, you just send it right into the dock. My son works at the fuel dock. <laughs> what, what's, what's that? Especially when you're trying to like finesse it in there. Yeah. yeah. Like the finesse is different on your boat than the boat that you're on, you know? Yeah, or someone puts it in gear and everybody falls on their ass because, you know, that's a big one. I've seen, I've seen a friend go flying out the back like he just jumped out the back. Yeah. There's a little tip for people on boats. If you're going to fall off, I just recommend don't try to save yourself. That's when you get hurt. Just jump off. Yep. You know? um, like my buddy, we, we were in gear and he thought we were in neutral. So when we went to put it in gear, he was kind of hanging out the back of the boat peeing and uh, – he got launched off the back and he just jumped over the outboards, you know? And, uh, yeah. yeah so the things like that. Um, yeah. So let's get back. I just want to get back. We talked a lot about, you know, being vessel assist. Oh, one other question about vessel assist. Why yeah. the, why does it take so long for your asses to get there? Like what? literally, like, I don't know how it is where you're at, but like, we'll be like 25 miles offshore. And it's like, yeah, okay. Okay. It was like, eight, like six hours later, the dude comes oh, rolling out. One of my friends was a uh, vessel assist captain, and um, he was like, he'd be at his house and had his, you know, his VHF at his house. And when you get a call, he just run down to the boat and go out there and get him, especially if it's a non-member tow. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, it would take like a couple of friends. It took hours for them to get out there. 
And I don't know if it's because they're going like eight knots, just kind of cruising, you know? Um, yeah. But yeah, um, to people, it was, yeah. That's why I'm always saying like in that amount of time, anything can happen. Do you have enough water? You know, do you have this? Do you have that? Yeah. Like never be dependent. Like, and always when you go out on boats, always plan on, um, you know, bring extra of everything mm. uh, with respect to space, right? Bring extra right. water and extra food. That always helps. I always operate under like the, the two is one, one is none mentality, you know? Right. Yeah. I got a tool. I got a knife. Okay. So I might not be able to have a pair of pliers if I lose this, but at least I have a knife, you know, and I can do a lot with a knife. So, you know, having doubles of everything, having extras of everything, food and water, like that's a great one. I always keep a gallon of water in the back of the boat that just sits in the, you know, in one of the hatches, whether it's for me to drink, which I don't really want to, cause it's been sitting there all season. But I guess like if I had to not the, not the worst option also like do another, like cleaning out stuff, medical stuff, like just having water on the boat, right? Fresh water. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Six hours. That's a long ass time. Yeah. I'm telling you, man, that takes hours and it's yeah. like, I'm there within an hour. That would be amazing. Um, are you hauling ass out there or how far are you going out usually? Um, like the farthest we go, well, we'll go like, very far offshore but we also have a bigger boat like we have a it's a 41 so we'll go it's okay. a coast tv um so we'll go offshore you know and that takes a while because like you're that far offshore you know if you're 50 miles out like you're 50 miles out i can't go any faster you know right um but it's like it's it's in the bay which is kind of where everything typically is like 30 minutes 45 minutes yeah in the bay they're pretty quick i'll say that but when we go offshore i mean you're sitting there for hours sometimes i fortunately have never these are all stories from my buddies uh i did have it at the mouth of the bay and it's funny you mentioned battery the battery died and uh yeah i was like ah, shit. that's a good one yeah and then the dude came and gave me a jump and then we were good but um he had uh the uh just that portable power pack you know yep and that thing is a lifesaver, man. Um, 300 what, bucks, I think, for the good one. So worth it. Yeah, get that for sure. I haven't bought one yet for me personally, but I plan to buy one for my truck and just leave it in my truck. Yeah. Well, and it's like you said, like it's always the typical stuff, you know, and it's always like simple fixes, battery cables, you know, batteries dead, out of fuel. And, you know, I think you, you mentioned it earlier in the podcast is like this whole you know, once you work on the water a lot and then you go out on your own boat with people, you're super, super cautious. You know, like I, I brought a friend out, I don't know, it was, it was like, uh, there's this concert that goes on by the water called Folk Fest. And basically we went out, sat out, listened to music, hang out. And I'm watching, you know, people try and anchor up and it's, you know, people kind of cluster together. So as they're anchoring up, I'm just watching the mayhem ensue, right? And the whole summer, I haven't been able to use my boat whatsoever. So I'm, I'm kind of like used to seeing all this carnage, but she wasn't. And, uh, and you know, I just, I simply pulled my anchor up. I, I came to the very edge of the group. I was like, all right, we're going to sit here and we're going to watch it all happen. And, uh, you know, it was just like, you're super cautious, like, you know, having someone up on the deck, like you, you almost have like this hyper vigilance around your own boat because you're just constantly out there you're constantly seeing the things not to do right and you're also more aware of um how naive a lot of people are and they just don't know so you you know what to look out for like you're saying i mean because you've seen it right like it's like a the boat ramp on a sunday you know it's oh, that's like quite entertaining best <laughs> yeah it's quite entertaining so yeah, just go sit there <laughs> well zach um uh, thank you for your time i know uh, I know you got to get on, get going and I do too as well, but I just wanted to thank you again for coming on and sharing uh, a day in the life of uh, vessel assist and also uh, uh, <laughs> your podcast. Um, so where can we find you and where can we find the podcast along the keel? Yeah. Well, thanks, you know, Brett for having me on. It's always been a pleasure being able to kind of chit chat with you, whether it's about, you know, the stuff that we see out on the water or, you know, just being a part of the podcast network. So you can find me at captain underscore Zachariah underscore Rollins on Instagram. That's my personal account, but it'd be super helpful. You go check out along the keel on Apple, uh, Spotify waypoint. And that's just at along the keel on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, pretty much anywhere. So we got a cool newsletter, got a cool, you know, thing, a uh, new website dropping up in October. So go check that out. And yeah, it's kind of where you can find me.
Awesome. Uh, thanks again for being on the show, Zach. Appreciate yeah, it. Thanks, Brett. Talk yeah. to you soon. Looking forward to working with you in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Same here. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Cool.